Arts Equity Speaker Series. Let me start that again. Welcome to the Artist Equity Speaker Series. My name is Karen Cappy Nugent. On the call with us today is my co-chair, Betsy Miraglia. Many thanks to all on the AE board who made this series possible, including Bo Dernbach and Robin Stone, AE president. A big welcome to Sarah Ward. Sarah is the founder and executive director of Sky Art, a nonprofit which serves up to 70 children a day. We're going to hear about how Sky Art came to be and the community she created, One Artist Center for Creativity. Today's format will be a brief introduction and then a presentation for about 35 to 40 minutes and a Q&A period at the end. So with that, Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself and then share how and why Sky Art was founded? Sure. Um, let me share my screen for my video or my slides. Hi, Michael. <laughs> my, one of my employees is on, which is awesome. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, hold on. I've got a puppy just for everybody so you know if I uh, say go to your bed, it's because She's being bad. All right, um, so Sky Art, uh, we are a 20 year organization. My name's Sarah Ward, I'm the founder and executive director. Um, this amazing space on the far Southeast side of Chicago. Um, during the presentation, um, I will show you, I'll talk about being in New York City, talking about going to Chicago to get my master's and working in an inpatient psychiatric hospital for four to 104 year olds practically. Um, then going to juvenile court to do uh, my last internship with my master's, getting my master's in art therapy and working for DCFS, which is the Department of Family and Children Services here in Chicago. I'm not sure if it's called that way uh, nationwide. Um, and then working for the probation department where I was the only um, or the very first art therapist hired in the country to work with kids on probation. Then uh, I moved into a neighborhood where I felt like I was going to make a bigger impact, opening the South Chicago Art Center on September or in 2001. My first class was on September 11th. And um, through that, I created a garden. I am a huge uh, fan of Maslow's Pyramid, a hierarchy of needs and thinking about um, really addressing the needs of the community and feeling like food was, was a huge need to address. Then starting Sky Art, uh, which just transitioning South Chicago Art Center into Sky Art into a bigger and more beautiful space. And then kind of talking about um, our transition from moving from art therapy to art ed and back to art therapy again, and then kind of what we did in the during the pandemic, pre and post, um, squeaky toys. This is the beauty of Zoom, right? Hey. All right, sorry. Um, okay, so this is the South Chicago Art Center. It was uh, almost like a one-room schoolhouse. It was 800 square feet. We were in this space for um, 14 years. And uh, for the first three years, I was the only teacher. So I made a lot of connections in the neighborhood and um, it was really beautiful, but we were kind of hidden in a neighborhood. Um, Chicago is very divided by uh, geographical um, structures like train tracks, there's rivers, there's viaducts. And when you go in or over anything, um, it's one race, one class. And so, um, South Chicago is very diverse. Um, it's poor, but it is diverse um, in its community. And uh, I, I like that um, coming from New York City. And here is an interior view of uh, the South Chicago Art Center on this day. We had 40 kids in here, which was probably 10 over fire code or more. And we had about 10 kids in the basement and about 14 kids in the backyard. So the de demand was high and it was this moment that we realized we really have to get a bigger space. We identified this space, which was three blocks to the west of us. It's across the street from a library and kid a corner from a YMCA. And I started to dream. I started to dream that this would be the perfect place for, um, for our art center. But I'll talk more about that in the lecture. This is what that space looks like now. 
um, fully redeveloped and active and inclusive for anybody who wants to come in and um, join us in our programs as long as you are seven to 24. <laughs> so uh, that's the community we serve. Um, and then this is our kids at our garden, um, just being kids, uh, we go there to plant, we go there to grow, we go there to paint, we go there to draw, we go there to sculpt. Uh, we use it um, in a neighborhood where there are not very many green spaces. We're able to um, um, give these kids a place to just be kids in a neighborhood that it's hard to be a kid in. And uh, just one last picture, and then I'll kind of go backwards in time. This is the one of the studios. Uh, we've got five studios in the space. Um, we've got a computer lab. We've got a ceramic studio. And this is like our largest studio where we do our Project Third Space Teen group. We do our Skyway group, which is identified as kids seven to 13. And we do AS for Art for little, little kids in Head Start programs around the neighborhood. Um, so just to jump in, uh, when I was getting my master's, oh, actually back up, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute and just see everybody's faces. So, um, I, when I graduated from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, I met a man named Tim Rollins and Tim, um, did a program called KOS in New York city in the South Bronx. And he, told, uh, or he spoke to a group uh, of kids that um, were at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design about his project. And what he did was he read classical literature to kids that were illiterate or um, learning disabled. And through him reading the classical literature, they would make huge paintings. And he said, um, hey, um, I can't do this for girls. I really want a woman to come teach with me. And that he spoke to me. <laughs> he didn't know he was speaking to me, but he spoke to me. And so like any um, ambitious and excited 23 year old, I literally packed up my car and pretty much moved to New York City without a confirmation of a job. Um, I was telling, I think Michael about it because I drive Michael home a lot. I was saying like, I wrote him a letter. Then we talked on the phone. I mean, like pre cell phone and email. It's just like the, mat, the, the hurdles you had to take to, to communicate with people were very different. And um, he was like, well, the South Bronx isn't for everyone. So you should come check it out. So rather than coming check it out, I just moved to New York City. And in that move, um, I called him once, I called him twice, I called him every single day of the week um, and he never returned my calls. So I ended up getting a bunch of, a bunch more jobs. I, um, I worked for the Lower East Side Print Shop and um, I got free printmaking um, studio time and I taught in the school system. And then I also worked for Thread Waxing Space, which is a gallery that also goes into the school system in New York City. And, um, you know, those were, two of my five jobs that I had in the city. And um, those jobs were the most meaningful to me, reaching kids and inspiring them through art. And um, it was 1993 and the, those disposable um, cameras just came up on the market. And I got all these disposable cameras and gave them to the kids and I said, go to your homes, take pictures, show me where you live, show me what your life is like. And when they came back, we talked about put it, making a book and putting an artist statement and taking a picture of them. And I asked them, you know, where do you live? You know, the artist statements, like where you live, what you're interested in, things you want to do and something about yourself. And the kids couldn't tell me what their address was. And they were 14. And so I started to realize that kids just exist in their neighborhood without really observing where they live and they don't leave their neighborhood. Um, I, I said to them, well, you're on the East River right here. What's the river on the other side? And they said, there's a river on the other side. And so it made me realize that they really do have a hard or um, a, a limited capacity for what the potential of their life could be, right? It's their, their five by five block is their life. And um, 
all of these things started coming at me and, re, you know, also realizing the teachers I was assisting were making so much more money than me that I was like, I need to get my master's and started looking into art therapy and thinking it seemed really interesting. Um, I always wanted to be an art teacher because my art teacher inspired me, but um, the art therapy part was really interesting to me. And then I found um, the School of the Art Institute where they had a cooperative program with the Rush Medical Center. So I was able to take psychopathology and development with medical students, uh, school students um, at Rush, which was really exciting and got into that program and left New York about four years after um, just entering my master's degree. And so I'll start sharing my screen again. Um, this is one of the pieces that, oh, of course, my tabs just closed. Hold on. And that typical, I know you guys can't speak. No but. worries. We can speak. No worries. My God, why did that happen? Sorry. Okay. Oh, there we are. Okay, so let me see full screen. I just meal. <laughs> So this is a piece, uh, so I worked in an inpatient psychiatric hospital. Um, and the reason why I'm sharing all this is because I think, um, you know, I work with young people all the time and um, kind of work with them about how, how do you figure out like what your life path is or what your passion is. And I feel like my life, there's so many things that happened to me that made me realize kind of led me to where I am today. And I always was really, uh, I always really acknowledged those moments and how important they were. And um, all of these things I'm sharing with you are, are these kind of pivotal moments that I figured out, um, you know, I don't want to do this or I want to do this. And so when I was getting my master's, um, the first, my first intern for my first year was 12 hours a week. And my second internship was, I think, three days a week. Um, and so my first internship was at a psychiatric hospital. And um, in a poor neighborhood and in Chicago, when um, a kid is hospitalized, they're usually just run through the place like three days they're in and then they're gone. Um, so I would only probably see them one day. So my goal of those meetings were to um, to really work with the kids and um, give them some tools to leave um, because I probably wouldn't see them again. And so this was one of a, a piece that I did with a kid, a group, um, and it was called, I asked them to draw their family. And art therapy um, can be really powerful with trauma. Um, it can allow kids to draw things that they could never say. And um, this kid witnessed a homicide um, and it was his father. And this picture was about that. Um, I read in the report what happened and he drew this and he was unable to speak about it. And um, these are the kind of things that made me realize how important art is for communication. And um, especially with teens that have such a hard time possibly communicating with adults that um, drawing an image can help them connect and help them share um, safely. The next, um, these images are from when I was at juvenile court. I, I did my second internship with sexually abused victims for a year. And uh, these were protection symbols I did with kids uh, because I thought it was important for them to figure out what they, fit, what they thought would protect them, to draw it, and then to maybe place it by their bed. So every time they saw it, they thought about not only creating it in a safe place with someone they respected and respected them, but also that it would remind them that they're protected, even though, you know, it's just, it's a symbol, but it can be, a symbol can be powerful. And I, I always wanted to write an article about this, but all the girls would do these like fairies with, you know, wings and, or, or, or roses and the boys would do snakes and spiders and like these really like vampires with blood dripping from their, 
from their teeth. And um, this, so these were art therapy sessions I did with them. This was something I did with them. Um, if you had your own island, what would you put on it? This can give you huge insight into what a kid's idea of important things in their life. And um, this kid did a, a dog fighting ring and uh, he had a strip club and a store and a house. And it was, it, it opened up an interesting conversation about why those things were important to him and what it is to um, create things that give you, fill you up or, or that um, take away from you and deplete you. This is from a, a girl and she did a nightclub and she did a shoe factory. And when I talked to her more about it, like there was no room for her family, only her friends could visit. And there was a shark sur surrounding their island. So um, excuse the pictures. I mean, these are like from the nineties, but um, this, uh, this is a great project. And I, I still do this kind of project with kids because I think it says a lot about what their resources are and who is important to them. This was a project I did um, with sexually abused victims. Um, it was a, an homage to Tim Rollins in that we read Dante's Inferno and talked about it as it paralleled uh, their sexual abuse in that um, hell represented the abuse when it was active. Purgatory was when they were unable to kind of function normally. And then paradise was um, when they were able to put that behind them and move on with their lives and you know have peace with it. Um, during this session, we did visual uh, a guided journey um, where I had them think about um, how that paralleled to their own life and what images came up. And then they did watercolors of the images. They cut out the watercolors and glued them to the pages of the book mom, that's your book or someone's in the family's book, by the way. I didn't put rip really out the book though. These are photocopies. <laughs> um, this was a piece I did with um, kids at, that were also juvenile delinquents. This is still um, when I, well, this was when I worked there and um, I worked at a, a boys and girls club. So boys and girls club in Chicago, um, they're like community centers. I'm not, I'm, I think Boys and Girls Club are nationwide, but these have only younger kids um, before six and then older kids after six. And so I brought these juvenile delinquents into a room when the younger kids were in. And it was really interesting, these younger kids, this, this painting is um, like six feet by four feet. And the younger kids would run in and like watch the progress. But what I, I realized in creating this with the kids is I, brought in all of these art history books and I had them look through them and decide for themselves what, and my one question was, what do you want adults to know that, that you don't think they hear? And it was interesting. They said um, they wanted to talk about the violence and they wanted to talk about silence. And I said, well, what's silence? And they said, silence is when you see something happening, a crime, and you can't you can't talk about it because it's forbidden. And I said, well, do you think that that's a learned, you think you learned that or do you think you're born with that? And they all thought you were born with that. And so it was, you know, the beauty of art is it allows for conversations that might not happen because they're so distracted by creating and drawing and filling in shapes and um, we had the most, the richest conversations around this piece. Um, one day a kid came in really angry and we set all the buildings on fire. So that was super cathartic for him. And I asked him how he felt at the end of the session. And he was just like, I feel so much better. Um, we decided there would be a big war between the angels and devils. And one of the kids looked and said, the angels look like they're evil now because they're black. Why is black always bad? And it was a great conversation about that um, idea that has been ingrained in him that black being black, blackness is a negative thing. And um, the little kids all ran in and at the very end and were like, oh, the angels are winning over the devils. And I said, who do you think is bad and who do you think is good? And they're like, the angels are good. And so we had a really great conversation about um, 
at what point do you start absorbing that negativity about your race? Um, at what age are you that you start seeing this, um, seeing yourself differently and have being more self-aware? So um, juvenile court didn't work out for me. Uh, I established the program. I hired, the, there was four art therapists when I left and I found the system to be extremely punitive. I found it to be misogynistic. I found it to be unfair. And Sarah, your sound went down a little bit. And is there something in front of the, there we go. I think maybe something was in front of the mic. Go ahead. Um, I, I found that the system just wasn't working for me and wasn't working for the children. And I didn't want to be a part of it. So I started exploring um, buildings and neighborhoods that had nothing going on in them and thinking about how can I establish a space for kids to just come in and be rather than me asking, did you get fed? Did someone hurt you? Um, when's the last time, you know, someone slapped you? Um, you know, I, I just didn't want to be a part of that system. Obviously I have the skill set to answer if a kid tells me those kind of things, but I didn't want that to be my sole purpose to find out you know, if something was going on with them or if they were committing crimes or if they were following their probation, you know, rules and stuff. So um, I was at a conference in St. Louis and I was talking out loud about my dream of opening a center in a neighborhood where I could just um, raise kids and kind of be that old lady on the corner that all the kids knew because I had taught them for years. And um, a woman that I was talking to at the conference was actually from Chicago and ran a nonprofit in a, in a suburb. And, um, and this nonprofit that she ran was for adult professionals um, exploring themselves creatively. And one of those women ran a nonprofit in South Chicago and said, hey, I wanna start an art program, but I don't know how to do it. And it's a really violent neighborhood and it has to be the right person. And the woman running the group was like, I just met her in St. Louis and she's actually here at juvenile court. You have to call her. So I, that week I, I got called by this woman, Liz Reyes and went down to South Chicago. Didn't even know it exists. I will show you a map of Chicago. It is, um, I just have to show you because not many people understand how big it is. Where is my... Ay, 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 ay. Hold on. Sorry, people. Um, Chicago, can you guys all see this? You can, right? No? Oh, okay. Not yet. Let me share my screen again. <laughs> okay. Thank you for saying that. Okay. So this is Chicago. You can see it, yeah? Yes. Okay. So this is South Chicago right here. This is the lake in the white. Um, sorry, this is the map I found. Um, and this is, if anybody's visited, you've probably been here in the loop. Chicago's huge. It's um, pretty spread out and very divided. And um, this neighborhood is as far southeast as you can go in the city. So most people, when you say I'm from South Chicago, they're like, I have no, where, where is South Chicago? They have no idea where it is. And, um, and I personally didn't know where it was. And so I went down there and I just fell in love. It's uh, 35% Latino, 65% um, African American. And it is this kind of Kind of amazing little space where um, where where we've set our home, and so I came down and fell in love, and uh, left the most secure job I had in my life to open Sky Art or the South Chicago Art Center. So here's Chicago too. Um, just the, the where it says Chicago is the loop, but these are where our programs were when uh, in 2018 when we decided or 16 to 18 when we decided to expand. Um, so most people think like, oh, you're just in that little storefront, but we are all, all over the city and now we're on the west side, um, pretty solid. So the west side is right, if you can see my cursor right here, where we're gonna start programs.
So just to show you some pictures, um, you know, I just wanted more um, equitable space for kids to be safe and explore themselves. And it was free and kids just came in and I just had like beautiful relationships with them. And like I said, I taught for the first three years of the programs. Um, this was my first group. I actually know every single one of these people um, on the picture still. Um, they're in their 30s and it's really beautiful. It's, you know, kind of crazy. Well, they're not in their 30s. They're almost in their 30s. Um, BC, I think is almost 30, but um, it's really beautiful to think that I've been able to be in their lives this long. Um, yeah, just uh, creating a spot where kids can just be and um, allow them to explore themselves and create and connect creatively. So this is the inside of our, our little space. And I would draw when they came in. So I did a lot of self portraits. And so when they would enter after school, I would be doing art. And so they would enter like an artist studio, which I think made a difference. Like it felt different. This is a big um, piece we did in the basement with the kids and we traced their um, profiles and painted it. And um, this is just one of many big pieces that we, we did, but this is a long, long time ago. Uh, we, we bring in artists from all over to um, share with the kids all their different um, techniques and, and mediums that they work with. And uh, we, we work really hard at getting artists from the neighborhood so the kids see friendly faces when they're walking around. And um, yeah, it's, I can't say enough of how, what a beautiful space it was. Here's our garden, it's four city lots. Um, in 2003, uh, the kids were like, hey, let's go outside and paint and draw. It actually in 2002 and it was really blighted. As you can see on the, at the far end, it's just empty lots. Um, South Chicago is a neighborhood where the steel mills were. And so all the land is really toxic. And so, um, but, it's a very big Mexican immigrant neighborhood. Um, one of the first, it's got the oldest Mexican church in the neighborhood and it's also just, uh, <clears throat> um, the, all the Mexicans came in when there was a strike in the steel mill, they brought in Mexicans, so they, they stayed and they farm. And, um, and so they farmed their backyards, not realizing that the soil was so toxic from the steel mills. So um, high mercury in the neighborhood um, is um, in, in like something, our, ours is, was at 240 and, um, and then cadmium was in the 900s. I mean, it's just like, it's toxic. So we built barriers and built this up. And so it is a hundred by 130 feet and feeds many, 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 many people. And now that we have this beautiful kitchen in Sky Art, we harvest food and feed our kids when they're there. So every day they're there, we're feeding them. Here's some portraits of a couple of kids. The girl on the right said she wanted to be the executive director. And I was like, you can do that. Let's, let's work on that. So, um, and then the woman on the left is um, one of my teaching artists. So she was a student. And then she was an intern and now she's a teaching artist. She has two young boys of her own and she's really been raised at Sky Art. Here's a, I thought that was so cute. This kid drew this of me. The kids would draw me all the time and uh, that was a great shot. Um, one of the big things of our program is taking them outside of their neighborhood, their comfort zone. Um, we showed them the city and all of the free things you could do you can do in the city. Um, we would take them on public transportation. I would show them how to buy a ticket on the Metra. The Metra is like kind of a fancier train in Chicago and it's a block away from um, where we're at right now. And so we would take that because it would drop off on Millennium Park, which is right downtown on the loop. And um, it was just wonderful. I would take them on a field trip every single month. And it was really beautiful to show them how to get out of their neighborhood. And it wasn't, they weren't going to a scary place because I can tell you they were concerned every single time that we were going to a scary place. 
And um, once they got the hang of it, they realized that um, there was more options in their life. And so here they are um, at the Art Institute and they, uh, there were people, like most of them have never been there before, even though the Art Institute purports to be an inclusive um, institution that really reaches to their communities. They just, um, it's hard for them. So it, it feels really good to be able to bring them there. And um, this is a young man who's at William and Mary and he's about to graduate in economics and I've known him since he was a little kid. And um, he's just, uh, yeah, giving, giving kids options in life is um, some of the most important thing you can do for, for kids who don't know what an option is. Um, this is an exhibit that I did um, called 400 or 343 guns. Four, 343 kids were shot in the Chicago public schools in the year 2012, 2013 school year. And so I was really moved by the fact that most people don't even kind of, uh, they can't absorb that. They can't like, I mean, I can hardly think like, it's hard for me to believe, but that's how many kids were shot. And so I did a project where I would, I commissioned artists and created guns with the kids so I could have a show so that people could, like they, they looked at the guns and were like, these are beautiful. They're candy guns. They were pinata guns. They were guns made out of stained glass and guns made out of um, cement and all sorts of materials, feathers, and someone beaded a gun. And um, they were so beautiful, but then, for when the, they read the um, the uh, narrative of the show, they realized that that each gun symbolized a kid that had been shot, and it was startling. And um, that was kind of the beginning of us realizing how do we get people engaged in what we're doing, and how do we show people what our kids are going through without hitting them over the head? Because I think people get so desensitized to gun violence or crime or you know, um, what's going on in, in, in poor neighborhoods. And um, I, I thought this was a great way to let people see it and see, um, see it without like in a sneakier way, kind of um, like with art therapy and kind of getting at people's issues and problems. And so at the end of this show, we sold every single gun to symbolically take a gun off the street as well. And um, it was a great show. And then the next year we did bullets and 93 people get shot every minute in the United States. So we did, we started with 93 and then we had an open studio where people came in and drew bullets. And then the whole wall was full of like, you know, in a week, I think it was like hundreds and hundreds. So we had hundreds of these. These are all one by one scratch board pieces. And this show went down to um, the University of Ohio where we had an opening there to, to talk about it. And then the next year we created a card show. We really like to get people involved. I think my mom did one, but I know some people that she knows did, but all sorts of people created um, cards. We did the, the mayor of Chicago, which was Rahm Emanuel at the time. This is Trayvon Martin um, and um, you know Medusa. And we had all sorts of playing cards kind of talking about, you don't know what, the, what cards you're gonna be dealt in life. And, um, and that was also a show that we got a lot of people involved in. So that was kind of this series of shows. And after that, we started thinking about, you know, what can we do next? And, and just to show you briefly, these are like three success stories. These are, this is from a little while ago, but I saw it in an old deck of mine. Um, Anthony on the left, he started when he was 12 years old and he's in his 30s now. Um, he was my employee up until recently. He taught the first class at our new facility. So it was like full circle. Alana, um, I met in 2002 and, and Anthony, he was in my second class ever. So he was September 12th, 2001, I met him. Alana was in, um, joined in 2002. She was the inspiration behind the garden. She was like, let's get outside, let's draw. And then um, Katerina, who you're gonna see in a little video I wanna show, um, which I'll see if I can, it looks like the tab closed, but um, she 
started with me at six and I ran into her during the gun show because I went to the 343 guns. I went to her high school to do guns with her senior class and she stood up and I hadn't seen her in five years. And she was like, Sarah, it's Katerina. And I ended up getting her into helping her get into college on a full scholarship with art she did at, at, at Sky Art or the South Chicago Art Center at the time. And so this is our moment of growth and opportunity. Um, I really, let's see, it's, I, maybe I won't show the video, but um, I'll send it to you because I wanted to show a video because it, it's a little bit longer than um, I'd like, but um, it's like six minutes, but uh, it really shows the, the energy of Sky Art or the South Chicago Art Center at the time. It shows like ooh, what the kids were doing and how they feel. And um, what are your thoughts? Should I show it? Let's see. I think I can show it. You could give it a try. We want, definitely want to get some questions in toward the end. Yeah. And we're at about mm, 22 minutes to go, 20 okay. minutes to go. Okay. Let's see if this is it. This is it. All right. You guys see it, right? You have to share, you reshare your screen. I aye, aye, aye. This is a racket. Sorry. Hmm. Ah, uh, screw it. Um, <laughs> sorry, I I have like two windows open and I can't. There it is. Sorry. Thank God we all um, kind of understand that Zoom ain't easy. All right, I'm gonna not gonna do it. Sorry. You can't see that, right? We can. Okay. Do you want to hit play? Yeah. I take care with kids on probation. I would take a kid out of the house that was on probation for some crime. I would look in the house and there'd be five other sisters and mothers sitting there who hadn't done anything wrong. I started realizing that all the kids that were doing bad things were getting a lot of attention. And I wanted to start giving attention to the kids that were ignored. Good afternoon. I see a lot of new faces here. Can I hear your name? Gustavo. Jessica. Jessica. Ruby. Ruby. Leila. Michaela. Michaela. My experience with art and success was that it's the first thing someone told me I was really good at. And so that's what I try to do with the kids. I've seen kids' faces where I say they're really good at this. It's like the first time someone's been able to recognize them for something that they do as an individual. That's a positive thing. Do you want to put a picture on here? At first, I didn't know that I was a good artist because people didn't used to tell me until I came to the arts and, and I started drawing. People really liked my artwork. They learn how to work in groups. They learn how to partner with each other. They learn how to create. They even learn how to use art as their voice in the community. I have kids that work for me that started in my very first class that are 21. Uh, I was one of the first students here at the Art Center when it opened in 2001. I was six years old. Right now, I'm interning for the summer. One of the greatest things I do here is interacting with the kids and helping them. That's like one of my favorite things to do here. Sarah came in to my class one day in high school. And, and you know, I stood up and I was like, Sarah, it's me. And I let her know, like I was going to college soon. There is a feeling in a neighborhood that's poor that kids don't go beyond high school. Sometimes they don't go beyond eighth grade. She wanted to get into college and no one was helping her pursue that. She genuinely cared if I went to college or not. And a good one, she knows the great potential in me and she saw it and she's like, you have to go bigger. That's what I try to do with the kids is instill in them that hope that you can do anything if you put your mind to it. You just got to reach out to the people who believe in you. I have four kids enrolled here, and they come home every day with a story on how they love the arts. 
the people that's inside of teaching the um, class, they really care about the kids and they um, love the community and they teach the kids respect, respect each other. They learn them how to um, work well with other people. It's a racially divided community. And so in here, we get them working together. We get them interacting. Um, we get them in the garden. We get them thinking more about what it means to transform a neighborhood, what it means to interact um, and be neighborly, what it means to be civically minded. We think about doing things differently where people see things and think someone's been here, someone's made a mark, um, someone cares about us. A defining moment for the South Chicago Art Center was about in 2006, walking by this old cleaners. It seemed like the perfect place to be more inclusive in the neighborhood. This moment in 2014 now is a time where we are actually poised to, to make that move. We've come a long way. We started with 18 students. Last year, we served over 3,000. We're in 19 schools. We're about to move into this beautiful, beautiful facility that's been locked up and boarded up for five years. This space allows us to hire the mothers that have wanted to help volunteer and be the welcoming committee. It's more centrally located. It's not where our kids have to cross gang lines to get to. It helps our kids and our teens interact with people beyond their block, beyond their schools, beyond their home. And it creates not only a place that's a third place for them that's theirs, but it also creates a bigger community for them. We've sustained ourselves. We've grown our programs. We've grown our individual donors. We've grown our foundations. We've grown our community support and our partnerships. And not only that, all of that, but we've really changed a lot of young people's lives. first project I saw Sarah do, she did a wishing tree. She brought an artist, she knew how to make paper, and on that paper they wrote a wish and a dream that they had for themselves in the community. I wish that it's going to be a place that just transforms so many more lives than we've already transformed. I wish that kids will remember it for the rest of their lives and it will be the place that changed them. So the big one, um, I'm going to go through the rest of the presentation pretty fast. Ariane, you guys there? <laughs> We are, we're watching, yes. Right. Um, so we moved into this cleaners. It was full, uh, full of suits from the 70s and uh, cat urine and asbestos and we redeveloped it. It was a time where we got 100,000 from the state and we got 100,000 from another um, donor and we started a capital campaign for $2.5 million to transform this space. Um, and it was beautiful. We busted out the drop ceiling and these bow trusses showed up. And here's uh, Anthony teaching the very first class there when I met him in the second class I ever taught as a child, which chokes me up, just like was amazing. <laughs> And then we, you know, I'll just go through our program. We have a make your mark. This is one of our make your marks and my dog um, there. But uh, when the kids walk in, they make a mark on a canvas. And over the course of 10 weeks and 40 hours of classes, they make a mark and these beautiful, beautiful paintings come out of it. Um, so every 10 week class, we put another canvas up and we sell those pieces um, for to raise money for our programs. 
This is one of our teachers, Maria V. I've known her since 2002. Uh, she lives in the neighborhood and she still teaches for us and she inspires our kids and um, is so patient and beautiful with them and amazing. I met her when uh, on her 50th birthday and now she's about to turn 70. This is our philosophy. Um, our, these are our three programs and this is all of our overlaps. So Project Third Space is our teens. Project Impact was created because of COVID, um, which is our art therapy program and Skyway, which is for our younger kids. Um, and then these are the intersections. Like the middle is the family table. That's the garden program. We feed every single kid in every program. Just Us is uh, teens that are incarcerated and it's a therapeutic program that um, I teach right now. And then we have a teacher in a, in a pre-adjudicated um, jail for kids that is teaching as well. And I think um, a couple other people are gonna start doing that program. Our schools and communities, I think we're in five schools now um, teaching uh, every day in schools on the west and south side and A is for art is for the little babies and Head Start program because when you read to a child they absorb twice as many words as then when you don't read to them and so our kids aren't read to so we we put them on the ground I'm going to skip over that we put them on the ground and allow them to um, just scribble and draw while we read to them. And uh, this was a, a giant piece we commissioned on the side of our, our building by Jeff Zimmerman. He has art all over um, the city. And uh, the three faces on the, the right are kids in our programs. This is our hallway. We, the, I remember a little girl came in and she looked at her mother and she's like, do I, can I go here? It's so beautiful. And so creating a beautiful place in a, in a poor neighborhood is so important for their just, you know, sense of self and feeling like someone cares about us to make something beautiful for us. This is a make your mark I did with kids in the juvenile detention center. Um, very similar, we just sat around and talked and they drew a lot of, they do a lot of gang banging on it, but it's important for them to be able to get that out of their system. This is our Skyway program. Um, it's one of my favorite pictures. Um, we allow kids to, it's process-based learning. So I realized that um, when the kids got out of school, they were exhausted and, to just let them draw and do whatever they wanted to do was so much more important than teaching them, um, you know, uh, landscape drawing or portraiture. I mean, if they want to learn that, we teach that, but it's more customized. So it's just uh, the kids just run around the studio and just migrate to artists that they're interested in and they learn how to do stuff and, and just explore themselves creative, creatively. This is me um, cooking for the kids. For the first year of P3S, which is our team program, I cooked for them every Saturday. And um, this is our new kitchen that we fundraised for so we could uh, cook bigger and better things and have a, I don't know, a nicer space. This is a Project Third Space teen drawing. Our, our team program is a little different where we teach them skills in the morning. It's about a six hour program on Saturdays and then in the afternoon they have open studio and they can do whatever they want. This is our A is for art program. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, the kids just love it. it. A lot of our kids and a majority of our kids don't even have crayons at home. So um, just allowing them to draw is like sometimes the first time they've ever done it. It's our studio full. Um, I always like looking at this picture because COVID was so sad. <laughs> um, we had, like I said, we have all sorts of different mediums that we have in the space. This is our, our project impact program. Um, this is our therapy and uh, we're serving, I think 50 kids a week. Um, and Michael can chime in, but around 50 kids a week with mental health care. Michael has a, a social work degree, but he is um, learning how to do art with the kids and really um, engaging artistically with, with our young um, kids and, and also inspiring our, our art therapist um, to be better at what they do and to reach, um, reach more of our kids. I'm just gonna pass over that. 
Um, and then that's our building. And I think that's the last slide. It's going slow. Oh, yeah. And for anything, anyone who wants to contact us, it's skyart.org or on Instagram, we're skyart NFP and on Facebook, we're skyart. So please like us, uh, follow us, sign up for our newsletter. Great. I'd like to jump right in. Wonderful. Yeah, I can't thank you enough. What what a great work and important work you're doing. Now, I'm sure we have a couple questions out there. Does anyone have one have top one top of mind? And if not, I'm happy to jump in. It was interesting to me that you you, you showed a slide of uh, photo uh, pictures that uh, children uh, drew. And uh, one of it was a, uh, what you called a fairy. And it was a sort of a, it looked like a girl with wings. And it immediately came to me, guardian angel, not fairy. Uh, just an observation. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Could have been a guardian angel. Just, they all did them though. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, fairies can be very nice too. I <laughs> just, you know, uh, we all wish for a good fairy in our lives. Yeah. But, uh, you know, just, for some, I guess because of my Catholic upbringing, I immediately thought of guardian angel. <laughs> anyway, okay, that's my comment. Great. Um, yeah. Thanks, John. So I'll ju jump in real quick with a question. Sarah, if somebody, like, how did you do all this? I know there was a lot of pieces that led to it, but... You know, you started out with that small art center. You know, did you get funding? You had, did you have a partner? Um, if somebody wanted to do this in in their town, what would they do? So when I first started, I I was connected to a larger nonprofit that had a track record. Chicago's very phil philanthropic, so um, and I don't know uh, East Coast wise, but Chicago in Chicago is really uh, supports nonprofits and. But a new nonprofit is different. Like they don't really support you because they don't trust you yet. And so I started off being a sub program of a large nonprofit that was respected in the community. And so for three years I was with them and then I spun off and became my own 501c3. And I had such a small budget that I was able to get it. And um, it was like, I think even in year 14, we were only at like $560,000, which is nothing, right? Um, well, it was nothing compared to now I'm at a million five. So um, just being part of that, uh, that system and being introduced to other nonprofit, or I mean, other um, family foundations um, allowed us to build up our budget. Uh, I got a board that was connected. I, we also get National Endowment for the Arts money. We get Illinois Arts Council money, we get city money, um, which is a smaller percentage of our budget, probably 20% comes from government. And then, um, you know, foundations are about 60%. And then the rest is individuals. And I'm sure to get that money, you have to show um, some type of measure, measure something in some way and say, we do X, this is what we're doing. Here's how we can measure it. What, what are you measuring? What are you sharing? You have number of children, you have people going through the program, you have longevity of them in the program. What, what, what else might there be that you could show to you know, garner even more support or keep your existing support? You know what, every foundation is different. Some people want measures like the National Endowment for the Arts wanted measures during Bush and now they don't. Um, so it, it like it changes year to year. Um, we, we do measure our impact and we do focus groups. We ask kids, do you feel better when you come in or when you leave before when then when you came in? Um, we do a lot of qualitative measurements um, because it, the reality is our kids, we're with them for two hours out of their whole day and they have whole lives that they're living outside and this, there's systemic problems that plague the neighborhood and and it's just the reality of um, you know, the, where we're at. And so if people do want measurements, we try to make sure that they, they kind of work within the, you know, the functioning of, you know, what we're doing. We don't 
bend to their, you know, uh, what they need from us. But um, we definitely do kind of work towards feeling like we're making an impact by just um, reaching out to our kids and, and surveying them. Yeah, I think that's a great way to have that really important story to tell. Um, yeah. can move a lot of people. How about some other questions? Anybody else have a question? Betsy, did I see your hand go up or somebody else on the call? Okay, um, that was fabulous. I was way beyond what, I just can't believe how much you have to do <laughs> and how you've taken it. Um, you've just taken it up, up, up from the very beginning. Um, I found it incredible the follow through that you have, how you get something that's a package and you work with it and then it goes on further, like, like the big port, you know, the big paintings and things like that. I just, the work is amazing that these kids are doing on those big paintings. Yeah. And, uh, just how, I like, I'm curious about the, the young people that you're working with in the prisons. Can you talk about that a little bit about, you know, how that helps them and do you know any that have gotten out in the period of time that you've been doing it and how they're doing? Um, so we're starting, we're, we're working towards getting an aftercare program started because we're having a hard time getting in contact with them after because the mental health services at our prison that we work at is really horrible. Mm -hmm. um, but I just ran into a kid. So I worked at the JTDC, which is a, a detention center before they get um, you know, found guilty or not. Um, and one of the kids I worked with ended up in the prison. And so I just ran into him last month and I'd worked with him for a whole year every day. Oh, wow. And, and then he just showed up at the prison. I'm like, oh my God, Adam. I was like, it was so exciting to see him. And so I will definitely keep in contact with him after because I have such a long relationship with him. But um, we're, we're talking with a couple of the kids that have gotten out. I mean, they're, they're just up against so much. And honestly, they're not getting any skills in the prison. So literally they're releasing them to just get put back into prison. Um, but the work they're doing, and I don't know where the slide went, but the work they're doing, um, we have a show coming up. Um, we're partnering with a gallery, Weinberg Newton here in Chicago, and uh, it's going to be a show around the work we have produced, the maker marks we produce with the kids. They are uh, nothing more than, uh, they're just spectacular pieces. Um, and uh, yeah, I wish I would have, that slide didn't disappear, but um, I, I'll send along the press release for it. It's pretty amazing. It's going to be called Block Block and um, kind of a play on like they live in their block. That's where they exist. And then they're on a prison block. Um, and I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a horrible system. That's why I left juvenile court. It's just like all, all across the board, but you know, we're really connecting with them. And so what I always hope is like, if I can connect with them in there, they can have that residue when they get out to say, like, I have connected with someone, I can connect with someone. Um, it's okay to connect with someone. And so that's, that's what's going on there. Yeah, you, don't, you know, it doesn't sound like you've had that ruling that we weren't allowed to hang hug kids. I, I don't hug them in prison because I'm a woman. No, not here, but I mean, how about in Sky Art? It's, you know, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't like, it, it's kind of a rule. I don't want people touching the kids and petting them or weird stuff like that. But um, yeah, I hug kids because, I mean. They need hugs. They need, they need touches. And they yeah. need good touch. And they need to know what a good touch is. And One other question. Do you have any vocational schools of working with you at the end for some of the older kids that maybe can't afford to go to college, but maybe they could get a scholarship or something. Because Julian and I have a foundation we just started with the vocational kind of background. And so that's what made me think of it. Is that something that you could link into something like that? So we are thinking about, um, so we're gonna do a new capital campaign for our opening a West Side, our new West Side studio. So we're opening a second studio on the West Side and um, it's connected to a welding shop. And so we're really thinking about like vocation and like college isn't for everyone. I have a kid that I, he, they got a full scholarship to college and she's gonna drop out already cause it's just not for her. And um, we don't have any connections like per se but it's definitely an option we suggest to kids as a valid option for their career path. And we just actually got a $150,000 
um, gift to start a scholarship program for college or a study abroad. So that'll be great too. So we're going to try, we, we took kids to Mexico. I guess a, a bunch of slides didn't show up, but we took, that was, I just realized that was in there too, but we took um, kids to Mexico city and it was their first time out of the country and then took kids from Mexico city to sky art. It was their first time in oh, wow. the United States. And so they, the, our kids visited a art residency. They're called Soma and we're talking, it's like 2000 bucks for the summer. And we're talking about sending kids down there for that scholarship. Very really, but that can be so impactful. You well, know? It's, it's just, you keep thinking ahead. It just, yeah. It just stop for it. There's all sorts of options and possibilities that they're directed into. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So proud of you. <laughs> Well, I, I want to, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. If there's no more questions, we're actually past the five o'clock no. hour. Does anybody want to? Oh, there's uh, Alice. Maybe. Alice. Yeah. Uh, what about um, publicity? Do you do your own publicity? Cause you, you're really out there. Um, we, we got, uh, during COVID, we engaged a public, like a marketing firm to, do press releases for us and we got a ton of publicity. Um, but we send out press releases all the time. I mean, if there's no news, the news picks it up. And I have um, my, one of my board members is a producer on ABC. So that helps. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, when you say press releases, you mean to newspapers? Yeah, we send out news tips. Like, you know, we, we just gave out 32 items of warm clothing to our community. And we sent out like, you know, a press release saying like, this is what we're doing. This is what's happening. And if there's no good news, they'll or no bad news for that matter, um, they'll come down and, and, and you know, give us right. um, a little interview. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So you're Super. working with the kids with, say that part about the clothing. I don't know if I got all of that. You, are they seeing you doing outreach, outreach work as they're growing up? Not the, all of them, but I mean, um, that's, that's something in the schools. I know my kids, when they were going to school, they all had to do a certain number of hours of outreach work before they could graduate. And I yeah. Want, and that's left a big impression on all three of our daughters. So I'm just curious if there are programs that you are doing for people outside of Sky Art that they see what they're doing, like coats and stuff like that. Yeah, um, well, the, the coats was a bad, bad call on our part. I mean, it took us all day to get 3,200 jackets oh, and-, and I'm doing and it. Was, I mean, two, two semis pulled up and my staff was like, oh no. And then we got a call after we handed it all out that we got to have another truck coming and people were like, nah. But we do work with schools in service learning, like the laboratory school 10th graders at the University of Chicago send kids. Um, there's a woman on here, Chris. She is one of our interns from the School of the Art Institute. I have two intern, or I have one intern from um, the University of Chicago's um, social work school. So we do get, um, you know, interns doing service learning stuff for us, but it was great giving the coats away, but it wasn't our mission. Oof, it was a lot. <laughs> well, good idea. <laughs> well, with that, I, I want to thank everybody. Um, John, did you have, is your hand going up, John? Did I, John Benigno? Okay. Um, all right. With that, I want to thank everybody and let you know that uh, our link to the recording will be available soon, definitely within seven days. Bo usually pulls that together pretty quickly for us. And um, thank you so much, Sarah. I'll be in touch. And uh, we appreciate you sharing your time, your story, your expertise. And hopefully people can get ideas and, and take it from there. Thank and you. Thank thanks you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Have a nice Thanksgiving. <laughs>